Get full episodes of The Damage Report as a podcast on iTunes and Android, and you can watch the live show every weekday on YouTube TV. Now joining us on The Damage Report, uh, Lauren Duca, journalist. Welcome back, Lauren. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to have you here. Uh, I'm excited on your thoughts on the midterm and uh, some of the stuff that's been developing throughout the week. Uh, First, (laughs) on the midterms, um, there's this debate going on about whether it was actually a wave, whether it was actually a win. I'm seeing like Brett Stevens is saying this is proof that the Democrats need to reach out to the right. Um, uh-huh. what, what do you think about this debate? Was it actually a win? I mean, I think that we've just lost so much to the kind of narrative industry in the political conversation now. This was never going to look like a landslide. It was, that's not the way change happens. I'm most interested in the way government is completely changing its face. I mean, the women that were elected, the first time runners that were elected, and the youth turnout. And this is the highest participation in a quarter century, and it's just the midterms. So I don't know. I am optimistic and geared up and I'm not gonna lie, I ordered another drink when I saw <laughs> Gillum and Beto lost, but I, I think that overall that we see progress. Yeah, I, I do wanna ask you about some of those races. So uh, you mentioned there we had historic total numbers of female candidates, uh, female candidates winning. We're gonna have the mm-hmm. highest representation I believe in, in Congress. And then you had standout- 100 race. women or will be seated for the first time in history. I mean, that's exactly. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is still wildly underrepresented, of course, we should acknowledge <laughs> that. But history, yay. Um, so you also had uh, you had uh, people of color winning in many races, you had LGBTQ candidates. Um, do you think that this is something that is definitely going to be built on in future elections? Is there any way to get, because m- m- almost all these wins were on the Democratic side. Are we gonna see any more representation on the Republican side in terms of more female candidates, people of color, things like that? I mean. It's hard to talk about this because I am somebody who, you know, has a set of journalistic ethics and also tends to identify with what is perceived as the left. So I guess something I want to be really clear about before I get into that question is I think that there is only one side right now. And I think that the one side is preserving democracy. And then once we can get that back in check, rebuilding it and fighting for equity and 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 a true you know a truer more equitable version of democracy i there's all different labels for all of those things we tend to see this new electorate this new leadership is happening most visibly on the left because those policies tend to track with equity and what we're seeing on the right right now is a lot of nationalism Mm -hmm. um, at varying degrees. So I don't know if we're gonna, there are going to be more women running on the right, but I think that that's sort of an irrelevant question because there's such a crisis of ethics happening um, that are upholding white supremacist patriarchy with through policy and the people who remain in power, um, and and something that I'm not going to lie was extreme an extremely upsetting takeaway is that you have such high turnout in a place like Texas yeah. and Ted Cruz winning. I always want there to be more people voting, um, but I, I am honestly truly mystified by the women showing up in droves to vote for Ted Cruz. And so I think that we still on the right there is there are. There are politically active women, there are politically active young people. I don't like to think about that and I don't totally understand what they're fighting for. But I think it has to do with who this country belongs to and doesn't and preserving old power structures. And I'm not very interested in that. (laughs) Yeah, so related to that, I noticed, I think it was in the governor's race in Georgia. I think white women voted 74% for Brian Kemp, which is Mm -hmm. a gigantic turnout there. So that's certainly rough. There's definitely a lot of progress needed to be made in a bunch of different areas. You briefly mentioned Ted Cruz. Was that one of the worst nights of the election for you when that race was called? I mean, you know, I think that those were the two big, two of the big ticket items. Obviously, the third was Stacey Abrams, and you had hope for one of one of those three coming through. I I still do think that. The fact that these people were able to call into question what might have been an impossibility, and by the way, Stacey Abrams is still not totally out of the conversation here. Yep. Um, I think that 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 was it was crushing to see the two of them. I was wasn't sure how tuned in to be, um, but I think that you know 
what Beto has done and uh, awakened is is something we can talk about kind of across the country where people are having these conversations more and more. They're opening their eyes to what is possible uh, and, and, and seeds are being planted. And you know, people who are from Texas are now saying, holy crap, that I might be, have the right to have a representative who actually represents me, who I'm actually excited in. And this is not just an inevitability and I don't just have to accept you know, a sack of cockroaches as the state of my <laughs> representation. And I think that the, you know, we see that those conversations spreading, people are looking at what's possible, people are looking at new new possibilities for what can happen. And so even though this was a loss in a lot of ways, it's, it's more of a rumbling of an awakening that will continue to happen and hopefully feels much bigger in two years from now. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I, I did want to ask you about some of the what's happened uh, since the election, actually. Uh, so I, I'm sure you, like us, maybe you're on the, you know, you're more to the east. It might have been a different time, but I woke up to the notification that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had fallen and uh, injured herself pretty badly. <laughs> what did you think when you saw that pop up? I thought that I honestly would just start taking out my ribs just in case. Like I just <laughs> thought I would just get a kitchen knife and like just take them out in case you need them. Maybe I'll put them in the freezer. I don't know. I I, I campaigned really hard uh, against Kavanaugh, and that is still was a really crushing blow. I yeah. I think that. Kavanaugh's confirmation is the worst uh, a lot of people have felt since November 9th, 2016. And as big of a blow as that was, I'm you know hoping that it riles people up and that that energy can continue to be translated into fury because it's just such a gross injustice. Um, I don't know. I hate to see. Yeah. I, I, I cringe to think of what would happen if if she she can't hold her planks anymore. Yeah. But uh, there's definitely a newly awakened group of people that is aware of the court, uh, aware of conversations about court reform even, I think, are beginning to gain some momentum. And we no longer see uh, SCOTUS as this kind of sanitized public institution that is not, you know, is is this, sorry, sanitized. It's a public institution, and it should reflect public will. And and the senators who are confirming it are reflecting their constituents, and, and that didn't happen with Kavanaugh. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know there was such a gross, uh, grotesque display of the Me Too tragedy uh, in the last weeks of it. But I was opposed to his nomination based on the lack of a public mandate yeah. and based on the lack of representation so you know whatever they whatever is thrown up in the wake of possibly losing Ruth Bader is will be a struggle but i think it's something that people are ready to take on uh, I do have one more question for you uh, so like the day after the election we had Donald Trump's press conference and he was mm -hmm. You know, he's his normal awful self, but he's been brawling with reporters. He seemed to have set his sights on every black female reporter that he can come across. He's yeah. changing the asylum laws. He banned a reporter. He fired Jeff Sessions. So he's been making a lot of moves these last few days. <laughs> like he's been okay. awful for two years, but he's been awful with a unified government. Now he's gonna face actual opposition. Are you worried that as bad as things have been, that we could have an actual worse, darker Donald Trump for the next two years? I mean, it's all, it's always gonna be worse. Like every day, I think it's just <laughs> it's worse based on projections of the past, you know, two years. Yes, but I, I guess it, that that is a check that we didn't have before. So I mean, I think that it will be crucial in uh, as we continue to see the rise of authoritarianism, and uh, you know, and I mean, just even. This complete and total disregard for anything even resembling democracy at this yeah. point. It is like there's not there's not a hyperbolic way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so at least there is some formal power to check to keep some sort of a check on it. And I mean, it's it is frightening how much power Mitch McConnell has now too. But uh, <laughs> but we do we there you know there there's some one of the one half of the branches of government might. Yeah keep us on track to not becoming China. <laughs> so Brooke, you, you had a question? I do, Lauren, <laughs> hi, good morning. I want to know back to what we were we were talking about the midterms and uh, you know a lot of like the this awakening of voters. But I want to know, does this make you hopeful? Um, even in the races that lost or we're not sure about, they are so tight. Does this make you hopeful for and and everything that went well 
encouraging more p- future politicians that they can run on these incredibly, you know, humane and progressive platforms and that it can work. Yes, and I, I hope so. And I also think it's it can't really be even understated that the way that these the fact that these races are even happening when they're even unsuccessful. I mean, the work of campaigning, the work of running that invigorates the health of democracy. Obviously, as I, I am very transparent about, I support it with progressive candidates. But really, anybody running, you're you're talking to more people, you're knocking on more doors, you're getting more voters to even begin to be aware that the positions exist. Like when we're talking about the top of the ticket, but it goes all the way down and 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 to to elected office at the local level, where you have people start to think about their agency differently, um, and and the more people we can have run the healthier our democracy is going to be. And I mean, I think run for something that specific organization has had such a boon in the past two years. I mean, they've completely taken off and they have some interesting statistics that I don't have top of mind. But I, I mean, I think people are only just getting started. And now we're seeing even more concrete evidence and hopefully it will build and build. But that, I mean, I think that that is absolutely an optimistic takeaway. Okay, and I think that, that that is a good optimistic point to end on as well. Lauren Duca, okay. thank you for joining us once again thank on The Damage you. Report. Great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.